All right, hi students. Today we're going to be looking at the rise of the Nazi party, continuing on what we looked at earlier with the problems of the Weimar Republic. This focuses on the Silver Stop Point methods used to establish authoritarian states, um, and it'll be really focusing around the role of the leader and moving on to, in the next lesson, use of force, propaganda, and poet persuasion and coercion. So we've looked at this uh, table of the Reichstag elections previously and what we're really going to focus on today is how does the Nazi party go from 12 seats in 1928 okay, all the way through to 30 in 1930 to 107 seats, again okay, 18% of the vote and then ultimately in 1933 having a near majority with 43.9% of the vote. What we've looked at previously, obviously the chaos of the Weimar Germany, we discussed in class regarding the political instability, the social upheaval, the problems of the post-war climate, and obviously the economic problems which Weimar uh, has to deal with. A couple of those obviously being unemployment and hyperinflation. The hyper hyperinflation is again caused okay, in 1933, really ramps up due to the rural crisis of the French invading uh, part of Germany and strikes in Germany which causes hyperinflation which is you know, basically means that your money becomes worthless. So Weimar, um, we know that the SPD leader Ebert um, becomes the Chancellor of the Weimar Republic and in 1925, he dies, okay, leaving a political vacuum. Okay, There's no one left to sort of take control. We then have a couple of people who become quite popular. Okay, Paul von Pinberg, who's an ex-retired um, field general from the German army, um, wanted Germany as their new president. Okay? However, he is obviously very right-leaning. Okay, He's very focused on conservatism, maybe rebuilding the Kaiser, okay, and fairly hawkish military views. In response to his election, uh, the government stabilizes army and right-wing groups, okay, welcomed his election, and due to his prestige, okay, people knew him, okay, they knew his face, gave the Weimar Republic some sort of respectability. We looked at previously um, with the Munich pushed. Um, their popularity and the growing popularity of the Nazi movement. So by 1923, the party party had over 70,000 members um, and was really a force in Bavarian politics, okay, which is an area of Germany. Um, and we get the creation of a group called the SA. Okay, and, um, we're going to look at them sort of a little bit later when we look at coercion. SA, okay, think of them very similar to the Freikorps. They're also called the Brown Shirts, and the aim was to promote the parties at rallies and protect the elites, and they did this in violent ways. They take people out, they beat them, they yell, they scream. Um, they're involved in sort of thuggish um, behavior on the streets. In October of 1922, the German Nazi party participated in German, German Day, where 800 SA members marched through Coburg, provoking a street battle with opponents, okay, led by the figure called Ernest Rom, who's gonna become important later on as well. Munich pushed, okay, was it a failure or success? Okay, we can debate that, but the result of it is that Hitler is in prison for six months. He gets a platform and popularity from this trial, which makes it, some, some historians believe it to be part of his success. Um, and he was able to display to the German people this idea of loyalty to the fatherland, okay? Um, required disloyalty to the Republic, that the Republic doesn't represent all of Germany and that he himself um, would, is you know, a staunch nationalist and a patriot of Germany. In his um, time in jail, he's obviously crystallized his views in Mein Kampf, which becomes a pivotal text for the ideology of Nazism. However, he is challenged during this time in jail um, by this man, Gregor Strasser, who um, starts to take um, some of the um, you know, force from Hitler. So while Hitler is in jail, okay, and obviously he's banned for two years for public speaking as well, so he doesn't really have a platform to speak on, Gregor Strasch becomes quite popular. Um, and this is during this time of the golden years of the Weimar Republic from 1924 to 29. Um, they control inflation, 
um, real wages go up, industrial production goes up, unemployment goes down, we get the creation of a welfare state where people have provided support if they're unemployed, and it leads to declining membership of the Nazi party, as you can see in the graph. And we have a peak in um, 1925, 1926, and then during these golden years, okay, into 1929, we have a decrease in party um, in unemployment, which you know, contrastly leads to a decrease in Nazi party um, membership. So with the decrease in popularity of the Nazi party, Hitler decides to reorganize the Nazi party. He sets up branches in all the major cities. He sets up the youth movement, which is the Juden for boys and the Band of Duchef um, for girls. Um, he then creates the SS in 1926, which is a Hitler's bodyguard, a gave a distinctive black uniform. They become quite um, symbolic of Hitler's power. And he creates party groups for specialized professions. He builds a sense of belonging and he begins to practice the ideas published in Mein Kampf. He then continues this grassroots movement, okay, really targeting lower middle income families. Um, and this is really evident in William Scherer's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which is the support for the Nazi Party had grown due to the country's problems of hyperinflation and the French invasion of the Ruhr. By 1928, Nazism appears to be a dying cause. Now that Germany's outlook was suddenly bright, the Nazi party was rapidly withering away. One scarcely heard of, heard of a Hitler or the Nazis except as a joke. Okay, And it's not until 1929, again, where we have the Great Depression, where Hitler becomes, again, a much popular figure. And that's really evident in the, in the graph here where we see Nazi power consuming. So he begins to plant the seeds within this grass movement. He travels throughout the country. He talks to... Um, farmers, he talks to um, laborers, he talks to industrialists, he talks to people, um, you know, the blue collar workers, and begins to you know, talk to them about his different ideas. The Great Depression hits um, and obviously hits the Weimar Republic hardest. The Mobile Coalition, which is established in 1929, which is a co uh, coalition of these four parties here became divided on integral issues regarding to the continuation of this welfare state, okay, providing social benefits even during the time of the Great Depression. Obviously when people need it most, but also when the government needs money in order to just help to um, prop up what's remaining of, of Germany. Presidential rule began um, to take over, okay, through the use of Article 48, um, in which uh, Hindenburg um, Point to the new Chancellor Bruning. Okay, so Hindenburg is ruling by presidential decree. Okay, using the Article 48, which gives him emergency powers to um, pass laws without the support of the Reichstag. So Bruning, um, as the new Chancellor, brings in a new economic policy, okay, and it's centered around this idea of austerity. What this means is he decreases government expenditure and increases taxes in order to create give more money to the government. Um, the government budget implemented was again passed through the use of Article 48 um, and as a result the Reichstag responded by passing a vote of no confidence in Chancellor which was carried by 250-60 votes to 1933 so he's not popular. Okay, Bruning asked the President to dissolve the Reichstag and call for new elections in September of 1930. So you can see government expenditure plummets okay, under this austerity okay, where we have very tight controls over government spending. The Great Depression again hits um, monthly unemployment shoots through up, okay, and by 1930 over 3 million people are unemployed. Nazism viewed as parties of action, criticised weakness of inefficiency of the parliamentary system, the divided political parties, the threat of communism, the social and economic consequences of depression. They really target all the key problems which the Great Depression highlights to the rest of Germany. And the Nazis, most importantly, tapped into the mood and resentment, okay. Germans during 1930s want change and they turn look for a bright future okay salvation and what that's what Hitler promises them the Reichstag elections in 1930 are pivotal for Hitler and the Nazi party they go from 12 seats to 107 and it's really a, a big problem around do we suffer Bruning's economic policy or do we face the really radicalism of Hitler economic policy continued through 1931 through the use of article 48 we again see more increase of taxation, okay, unemployment relief plummeted, wages decrease, and unemployment continues to rise, okay, in October of 1931, that should be, to 4.6 million. 
Bruin was successful in ending reparations, however he lost office before this was fully endorsed by the Allies. Okay, so he loses his kind of shining moment of glory, you might say. Um, and this you know, Franz von Papen, who becomes the new Chancellor, ends up taking um, you know, the praise for this. Again, we move forward another two years to the 1932 presidential election. Uh, Hindenburg runs again, and so does Hitler. Okay, they're the two in a real sort of two horse race. The communists and don't really have much of a, a popularity. As you can see, they're 13.2% of the vote. Uh, Nazi membership now hugely grew to 450,000. Um, and uh, Dr. Goebbels, okay, who becomes the propaganda minister, organized an intense three week campaign where they organized 30 meetings a day across the country. And this is called Hitler over Germany. It's a huge campaign that we hadn't seen before. Hitler uses um, you know, what we now assume to be you know, pretty standard parliamentary tactics of going visiting people, you know, making himself um, in the limelight. Um, back then, it wasn't really something that politicians do. Um, you know, publicly campaigning, okay, and appearing across 21 cities in one week. So he's working hard in order to gain gain people's votes and people's trust. The German army, okay, again, um, has a role to play in supporting Hitler. However, they have kind of late to join the party. Um, they want a return to a stronger authoritarian government, okay, to deal with the Great Depression. Um, but they're, again, um, a bit worried by Hitler earlier on. Um, General von Schlinker, um, which is a conduit between the army and the political parties, was impressed with Hitler's right-wing views, but still viewed him as a radical. He th thought that he could kind of control Hitler, um, and he believed that you know, even though the Nazis were not very decent chaps, they must be stomached with the greatest caution, and if they did not exist, we would certainly have to invent them. So he thinks there's a need for them but we must be very careful when, when dealing with them. So he begins to start to formulate um, support for the Nazi party within the army. Bruning and von Papen, after the president of his election, defense minister, General Groen, sought to ban the SA and SS, okay, due to their violent behavior. These people that are going out and beating on the streets, okay, especially during election times. Uh, Schilinka, okay, the correspondent between the army and political parties, used his fear, uncertainty, and instability to his advantage as he manipulated Hindenburg and convinced him that Brüning was no longer acceptable and that the ban unsettled the army. And at the end of May of 32, Brüning asked, uh, Hindenburg asked for Brüning's resignation. And as a result, the chancellorship shifts to Franz von Papen and he formed a 10-man cabinet, cabinet of barons, okay, which are right-wing industrialists. He represents real wealth of Germany. Okay, Again, he doesn't really connect with the lower middle income um, majority of Germans. In 1932, elections were called. Schlinker secured understanding from the Nazis to cooperate with the new government if a ban on SA and SS were lifted. Um, violence again erupted on the streets between the SA and the communists, with 86 people killed. Again, we have chaotic, you know, just chaotic scenes in Berlin um, and in major cities such as Hamburg, in which 17 Nazi Nazis marched through, leading to 19 dead and over 20 injured. Hitler returned to key themes discussed again in the Hitler over Germany campaign much earlier. And finally, uh, the Nazis become the largest party, with the communists becoming the second largest. So we've got one party on the super right wing and the communists again, again on the super left wing. So really, it's quite um, extreme political parties with polit you know, extreme political views. So despite winning the majority of the seats, um, President Hindenburg, who obviously you know is ruling by President decree a lot of the time, he refused to appoint Hitler as Chancellor. Um, he says that this is um, you know not someone who should become Chancellor. And Hitler goes out and to announce there's nothing is more difficult than to tell victory flush troops that victory has been snatched out of our hands. It's been snatched out of our hands by Hindenburg. Uh, the Schellinger gave the correspondent to the army and the political parties hoped that the Conservatives would support Hitler. However, they were reluctant to give him control as Hindenburg offered him vice-chancellorship, which Hitler refused. The Reichstag met in September of 1932 and Papen had no political support. Parliamentary vote was carried again, gave a vote of no confidence, um, and you know, von Papen is wide, you know, hugely unpopular and defeated, um, and it was dissolved on the same day it sat. So again, political turbulence, okay, still in 1932 regarding who's going to become Chancellor. 
So we have a fourth National National of the Year. Okay, if you're in Germany, okay, you have to go to polls a lot in 1932. It created problems for the Nazi Party due to the funding. Okay, they had so many elections in the same day, same year, they were unable to keep the funding going. Um, and they actually lost seats, okay? They went down, okay, to 196 seats um, and only 32%. Papen was encouraged by the results, however, still led the government that was able to act without prudential, uh, presidential decree use of Article 48. Von Papen um, finally um, is defeated by Hitler, you might say. On the 1st of December of 1932, uh, he proposed to Hindenburg that the Reichstag be suspended and that presidents should assume direct control until the crisis passed. Schillinger viewed Papen as a failed, uh, uh, viewed Papen as a failure, as unemployment neared six million, the prospect of civil war was slowly becoming a reality, and he takes steps in order to remove von Papen, similar to Brüning, again persuades Hindenburg that von Papen had lost confidence of the army, okay, maintaining support of the army is central to control of Germany. He asked von Papen for his recognition and to appoint Schillinka as the new Chancellor. So we get Schillinka as the new Chancellor. This is him here walking his dashes. He attempted to bring the Nazi parties into power by striking a deal with Gregor Strasser, offering him the position of Vice Chancellor, okay, which obviously divided the party. Gregor Strasser, again, reminding of before, is a man who tries to take power of the Nazi party during Hitler's um, prison sentence and when he can't talk. Uh, or can't um, have a public audience for two years. Hitler forbade any deals and required the oath of loyalty from his members. Um, again, this despair grew within the Nazi party. They seemed like they were going to take control in 1932. However, they failed. They got, you know, um, limited fund support. It kind of peaked. The membership was going down, and, and the faith that it would actually take control of Germany was, was starting to dwindle. He was also unable to get rid of von Papen, who stayed in Berlin. Instead of taking position and committed, he was committed to restoring his power and removing uh, Schellinger as his successor. Finally, uh, Papen and Hitler met in Cologne, and the successive meetings followed, which included uh, Oscar von Hindenburg, the president's son, and uh, Otto Messina, okay, Hindenburg's advisor. In these meetings, Papen planned a coalition government between the NSDAP, the DVMP and his conservative supporters. This would be the first majority since the 1930 Muller government. Industrialists directly supported Hitler as they, as they supported Papen's plan. So von Papen, in order to get back at Schlenker, you know, comes to Hitler and says, you know, we just get to get rid of him. Um, he took my power from me. I'll support you when your aims to become chancellor. Finally, Hindenburg, you know, he's described as the guardian of democracy because he doesn't allow Hitler to become chancellor. He permits Hitler to become chancellor and ultimately lets Hitler, you know, take become ultimate dictator. So Papen, the vice chancellor, was able to be present whenever the president met with the chancellor. Of the eleven cabinet posts, only three would go to the Nazis. Other cabinet posts would be held by conservative supports of Papen. Uh, Minister of um, Economics held by Halberg, which is the leader of the DNVP, and Hindenburg chose the general. Von Blum for Minister of Defence. So even though Hitler does become Chancellor, there's a list of um, requirements that Hitler has to maintain, so he does limit his power somewhat. This is called the Cabinet of National Renewal. Okay, it's appointed on January 30th of 1933. Only three are Nazis, but Papen allows it to control the Prussian police and, and hold elections, so he does become Chancellor. Lundendorf's letter to President Hindenburg, okay, remember Lundendorf, we looked at him in 1918, okay, he's the um, general of the German army during World War I. You have delivered upon our holy German father to one of the greatest demagogues of all time. I solemnly prophesy that this man, this is a cursed man, will cast out the Reich into abyss and bring our nation to inconceivable misery. Future generations will damn you in their grave for what you have done. So Lundendorf is very critical of Hindenburg's appointment of, of, of Hitler as Chancellor and really um, you know, foreshadows some of the problems that are going to come within Germany and to German people. So the creation of dictatorship had three stages. We obviously have the rise of popularity in Hitler before this. We then have, um, he gets into election, uh, he gets into chancellorship, and now how does he transform his rule as Chancellor into um, a dictatorship is what we're going to focus on next.
Alright, so now we're going to look at the way in which Hitler transforms from a chancellor okay, into a dictator. Okay, it happens in three steps. First, increase in and centralization of executive power. Hitler becomes the focal point and through the enabling act, okay, he becomes the dictator. Second step is the removal of rival areas of political power, um, ensuring that he becomes the only political party. Leads to the end of trade unions, growing national influence over local communities, youth groups, professional organizations, and religion. This sweeps the nation. The third is the establishment of influence and control over elements of force, okay, the army, and police. And he establishes what can be called a police state uh, through an understanding with the army and Nazi regime ends up having control of both the police and the army. So how does he go from a chancellor to a dictator? His first step is the Reichstag fire. So in February of 1933, uh, Hitler obviously wanted the Nazi party to gain full control of the Reichstag, okay, without needing um, approval of the government or the president. Obviously, he's in a coalition, remember, with those other parties. He wants to become the majority party, and he wants um, the Reichstag um, to not have Hindenburg in order to sign off on what he wants Germany to become. He dissolved the Reichstag on... Um, and carried for fresh elections in March 1933. Okay, so the Reichstag fire, um, the election date, okay, was set for March 5th, 1933. However, on the 27th of February, okay, the Reichstag burnt down. Okay, and the Nazis blamed a young communist, um, Marius van der Lubbe. Okay, he confessed to the crime. Whether it's whether he did it or not is is debatable, and whether the hit, uh, Hitler found him and then forced him to um, confess to burning down the Reichstag um, is, is up for debate. However, what ends up happening is uh, a state of chaos um, takes hold in Germany. So Hitler claimed that the country was in grave danger and convinced the president to give him emergency powers to deal with the growing communist threat okay, and it would burn down the government. Hitler arrested the communists and other opponents of the Nazis on all civil and political rights, such as the right to hold meetings, were suspended. He's able to do this through the use of Article 48. So we have here, we've got Hitler, and we have President Hindenburg, okay? Um, you can have a look at some of these questions, but we have this red peril, okay? Who does that refer to? It could be the communists, and this emergency powers referred to, again, okay? We've got this vision of, you know, the fall of the Rome um, with, you know, dressed in togas. It's quite an interesting um, punch cartoon. So, in March, with the new elections, okay, they Nazis win the most seats, um, again, taking control of 43.9% of the votes. Um, they do not have the two-thirds majority. That was required by law if they want to change the constitution and get rid of Hitler, get rid of Hindenburg, sorry, as president. Um, but through a coalition with the DVMP, um, they grew to um, 52%, and they now had a majority. Not two-thirds, but had a majority. On the opening of the first uh, parliament of the Third Reich, held in Potsdam, city of Frederick, uh, the great king of Prussia, and symbolic return of, to this um, imperial greatness of Germany. Okay, this happens in March 21, 1933. Um, what Hindenburg says, this new beginning will liberate us from the selfishness and the party strife and bring us together, bless in a proud and free Germany united within itself. So we've got the end of the fragmentation, the political turbulence, the volatility of the Weimar Republic, and we now have a strong majority government under a strong leader, that is Hitler. So Hitler, even though he has now has majority, okay, he's still not dictator, he's still just chancellor. So he wants even more powers, and he asked the Reichstag to pass the Enabling Act, which would give him dictatorial powers for four years in order to manage the great problems confronting the nation, things like the communist threat, unemployment, um, social upheaval, there's a, you know, a huge wave of problems which, which are plaguing Germany during this time. He couldn't ignore the constitution and the Reichstag um, um, with the, these new enabling acts. Uh, he becomes dictator. However, in order to pass the Enabling Act, Hitler needed a two-thirds majority of the Reichstag as it represented a major change to the Constitution. And this is, you know, where we go back to Star Wars again, very similar to what happens with Emperor Palpatine taking control of the, um, the Senate. Dictatorial powers, okay. 1881 KPD members elected a few weeks earlier were not in attendance at the temporary meeting of the Kroll Opera House in Berlin. He actually changes the location from the Reichstag to the Kroll Opera House in Berlin. 
because of um, the Habreichstadt being rebuilt. After the election, KPD was supposed um, was suppressed and its elected representatives fled or were arrested. So Hitler chances upon this, okay, and he um, makes sure that he has all of his members there and his um, supporters in the DVMP um, needed to um, change the constitution. So Otto Wells, leader of the SPD, champion of democracy, was vocal in condemning the proposal. Um, and when the vote was called, 441 members of the Reichstag voted in favour of the Enabling Act with the support of the Centre Party. Um, 94 SPD members voted against and the Centre Party was assured that basic institutions of government were not threatened and the measure was temporary and necessary in order to deal with the, le the threat from the far left. So they're kind of uh, persuaded into supporting Hitler, you know, temp you know because he says it's only going to be temporary. So as a result, he gets his two-thirds majority. And as a result, he calls new elections in 1933. Since the Nazi parties were the only political party, vote uh, was used as proof of the popular appeal of the new regime. The Reichstag became a place for Hitler's pronouncement and the most highly paid male chorus of the world. This is an example, okay, of, again, these um, November elections in 1933. We've got Hindenburg, we've got uh, Hitler here, okay, and we have Nazi troops surrounding the voting post saying, if you don't vote Hitler, um, you know, you know what's going to happen again. And we'll let the German people decide is the, uh, is the message from David Lowe. So, on 2nd of August 1934, Hindenburg died, and the last limit on Hitler's power was gone. In the day before the law concerning the sovereign head of the German Reich was prepared, in which combined the office of the President and the Chancellor, and Hitler ends up becoming the Fuhrer, so it means he's the head of state, head of government, and the supreme commander of the armed forces. So this law concerning the sovereign head of the German Reich is foundational in Hitler becoming um, dictator. Okay? This is the, the document that really sort of seals the deal for Germany. In 1934, we have a referendum um, where what it asks is the office of the President and the Reich is unified with the office of the Chancellor, Consequently, all former powers of the President of the Reich are demise of the Fuhrer and the Chancellor of the Reich Adolf Hitler. He himself nominates his substitute. Do German men and women approve of this regulation provided by this law? So this German referendum asks them, do you want Hitler to become dictator? Um, and because of the way it's been framed, um, they posit Hitler's popularity, it's voted for 88%. Um, and we've got um, Ian Kershaw here, accounting for the manipulation of the voting process, states that re reflected the fact that Hitler had no back, had the backing much of feverly enthusiastic and of the great majority of German people at the time. Um, so you can see you know, how many people we have voting for um, Hitler. So as a result, Hitler becomes the dictator of Germany and has total control of Germany at this period of time.